All right, so welcome back, everyone. JP, are we talking about something um, near Earth today? No, this one has yet to leave Earth. Oh. Uh, although, maybe a little bit briefly. <laughs> uh, so today I want to talk about the Crew Dragon. Nice. Uh, this is the crew version of the SpaceX Dragon spacecraft. Mm. Uh, and I'm really excited to talk about it because uh, just yesterday, which will date when this is getting recorded, <laughs> I guess, they have released some uh, teasers uh, for what the interior of the spacecraft may, might look like. So let me take a step back here. And, uh, you know, SpaceX is, you know, the launch service provider that's been building the Falcon 9 and delivering mm -hmm. cargo to the space station and satellites to orbit and all this good stuff for a number of years now. Uh, their cargo vehicle is called the Dragon. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, it's named after Puff the Magic Dragon since no one thought it would be a reality. <laughs> <laughs> he does wow. live. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so it was always designed with the idea that people would go on board, but, you know, the way these things go is that it's like, all right, well, we've learned a number of lessons, and it's probably a better idea to kind of start from scratch. Mm. So when spa oh, NASA came along and said, look, we want to do a contract for delivering astronauts to the space station, mm since we don't have the shuttle anymore, uh, SpaceX stepped up and they proposed uh, what they call Dragon 2 or Crew Dragon or mm. Dragon Rider. Or there's a couple <laughs> different names out there. Um, and last year, they, uh, or maybe even the year before at this point, they uh, revealed this sleek-looking vehicle that you can see on your TV there mm -hmm. of the Dragon version 2. It's got some real slick um, motors or engines built into the side of it that can be used for... Uh, uh, numerous things when they can either use it to abort in case of launch vehicle failure so mm. they can just kind of pop right off the top of that and nice. fly away mm. or if they didn't abort what they can use it for on the way back is rather than landing under a parachute in the ocean which means you're going to land in a pretty broad area mm. and cover all your electronics and horrible salt water you can just come down with the rockets in a propulsive landing wow which is kind of crazy but rockets are really precise mm. they can just land in like a helipad uh, wow. Which is yeah. great because all of a sudden your recovery costs are zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a little terrifying because it's like, hey, you're coming in under rockets. Like if they turn <laughs> off or something, you're in trouble. Mm. But they've got eight of them on there. I think they mm. only need like six, maybe even five yeah. to pull off the final landing. Mm -hmm. They test them right before landing. And if it doesn't work, they just pop the parachutes. Gotcha. Uh, but yeah, so a big speculation wow. is what's the interior going to be like? How is this going to work? We know it's going to carry seven people. Uh, we know that you know they're kind of taking a different approach to this from a typical spacecraft. Like uh, so, when they first revealed it, they showed this uh, bare pr um, pressure vessel, just like kind of like hmm. the ISO grid pattern of hmm. metal on the sides. And Elon gets in into this kind of chair in there and pulls down this ridiculous giant three giant touch screens that look like they're lifted straight out of a Tesla Model S, which I'm pretty sure they were. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. uh, and the idea is like, look, cats are fighting. <laughs> uh, the idea is, you know, we're going to, this is the digital future. You know, our computers mm -hmm. are better. We don't need to have thousands and thousands of physical switches. Mm -hmm. Thousands and thousands <laughs> of physical switches to uh, operate this vehicle anymore. Uh, you know, we've moved on from that. We can mm -hmm. be, you know, it's safer to not have a lot, all that wiring. Mm -hmm. You can have customized interfaces for whatever the situation oh. demands, even on the fly during the mission. Yeah. You can cut, change that, and, uh, update it. Drops down um, on weight. Uh, yeah, the weight, uh, payload. Yeah. Weight, absolutely. It just kind of makes a simpler vehicle all over. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there's been some controversy over this since a lot of people, you know, especially myself as a software <laughs> engineer, kind of go, ha ha, like <laughs> software, mm. user interfaces, nothing ever goes wrong there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's kind of like, you know, what is an annoyance on an iPad could be a matter mm. of life or death on a spacecraft. Oh, yeah. But I've kind of come around to the idea of, like, I think it's probably a good idea. Mm -hmm. They they keep all the really crucial features still on hardware, mm. switches and knobs and uh, control sticks and all that still mm -hmm. available. And to be honest, like, you know, I think it'll help to kind of shed this image of the astronaut as, like, the hotshot test pilot, yeah. which is no longer really what it needs to be. True. Mm. And astronauts are still super, super cool, mm. but in a different way. It's yeah. like... You know, we don't need you to be Buck Rogers. We need you to be a systems engineer who mm -hmm. understands every aspect of how this vehicle works and every way it could possibly fail and what did that thump mean and all this <laughs> other stuff. And to do all that, you don't necessarily need to be super, super hands-on all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's kind of a natural evolution of how spaceflight's going to work. Yep. Um, and to be honest, it's pretty similar to like how modern aviation works to a certain mm, extent. I mean, true. you know, like the 787 isn't quite down to the level of having a few touchscreens and a couple buttons, but it's certainly, mm. you know, fly-by-wire. It's, you know, those uh, 
The 787 recently they discovered a software glitch that never came up. Oh, but yeah. if they had left the engines, if they had left the machine, the plane booted up for eight months, right. uh, all the engines would have just turned off. Mm -hmm. So it's like, uh -oh. <laughs> you know, yep. stuff like that uh, exists, and we accept it. And we put, you know, I would get on a 787 without thinking about it. Yeah. So, you know, I think it makes a lot of sense for the simplicity and mm -hmm. affordability of these vehicles. Well, and uh, lest we forget, you know, software can be upgraded and improved a lot faster and a lot simpler than a whole bunch of switches too. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. I think that's a really big part of it is that, you know, you're going to start seeing, like, you know, the shuttle was a, you know, mm. when they upgraded uh, the cockpit of the shuttle, it was a major thing. Vehicles mm. were down for years, mm. and it was this whole multi-million dollar thing. Uh, I think, you know, if they want to get a new interface into the Dragon, uh, Crew Dragon, they just like, up you go. <laughs> Plug, you know, swap here. Just, yeah. yeah, exactly. So I think that's going to lead to some really, really interesting scenarios. Well, and they've been doing that already with the, um, you know, some of the Dragon launches where they can, you know, notice something wrong, uh, you know, not long before launch, just tweak the software, upload it, and they're ready to go. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they pa they patch software on Dragon all the time. In yeah. fact, I was joking about, uh, you know, when CRS seven broke up and mm. they were in contact with Dragon. You know, it was only like two or three minutes till Dragon hit the water, and mm. I was like, I w "You want to bet Elon was just strangling some <laughs> software engineer, saying, patch it, patch it, patch it.'" <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, but that's the thing, mm. though, is that the next time they launch Dragon, it will be able to do that. Yeah. The software is mm. easy, easy to update. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I think it's going to be pretty okay, especially because it's, you know, some backup systems they can fall back on. Mm. Like they've got, um, you know, the spacesuits that they'll be wearing will be, mm. you know, presumably uh, pressure sealed and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. They revealed a little hint of what the suits will look like. They look Ooh. kind of like, imagine a very light themed uh, Daft Punk. <laughs> wow. <laughs> these, big, these big tinted full face plates, uh, kind of like sleek, uh, non-bulky, no hoses everywhere, kind of motorcycle look. Wow. Which is interesting because, like, uh, there raises a lot of questions. Like, all right, you know, how is it? How are you keeping the air in? How are you yeah, handling uh, oxygen? And that's all that's, stuff, that, that's not designed for EVA or EV. Well, no, is it? No one really knows. Mm. <laughs> so it's like, you know, it could be the kind of thing where it's emergency only in, yeah. in case of a cabin depressurization, or you know, these guys are kind of crazy. They might want to <laughs> try pushing it, uh, pushing the boundaries a little. Well, bit. It, it's a lot like um, you know, in, in Gundam we have the normal suits where they are these you know very simple, like you say, sort of you know like a, a motorcycle jumpsuit almost that you put on that's there in case of loss of, of pressure, in case of those things, you know, you'll survive, but you're not meant to go outside for hours in them. Maybe. Yeah, it's a, l a lot like the Aces suits, the advanced crew escape mm. suits that the shuttle astronauts used after the Challenger accident. Those, uh, you know, big bulky orange suits. You know, they were a little bit. You know, it's pretty much the same idea. Like you mm. wouldn't go outside in the Aces suit, although I'm mm. sure you could mm -hmm. get away with it yeah. for a little bit. It was just there for like, okay, there's no more air. Let's go home. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So you know, they may have that in mind, but mm. you know, there's a lot of speculation about what those suits are going to work out to be. But sure. you know, they're in the teaser trailer now, so who knows what, nice. what they're up to. Are, are, are they thinking what the service life of this will be uh, as far mm. as how many flights it could make without, uh, mm. uh, I, 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 I suppose, for uh, p potentially either for being superseded or uh, just durability use? Yeah, I think that's a big open question. Mm. Uh, you know, other than the shuttle, we've never really reused spacecraft before. True. And the shuttle almost doesn't count because <laughs> they refurbished it so much mm. that it was just like, you know, yeah, this is the same vehicle at a certain level, but you, you kind of cheated. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's one reason they're really eager to get, like, for instance, mm -hmm. one of the Falcon 9 first stages back mm. is, you know, they can finally see, you know, hey, this works or like, oh, hey, this is all messed up inside. we got to fix this. <laughs> So I don't think they're going to know until they start flying dragons. Yeah. Multiple times. Wear and tear and mileage. <laughs> and and yeah, exactly. And granted, that's the, the the SpaceX way. You know, go out and try it and see what actually happens instead of trying to speculate. Well, we think we'll get three or four. No, we'll just keep on doing it until it breaks. Yeah, for sure. Because the thing is, like, you know, NASA has speculated that they want a fresh dragon every time, which makes mm. sense. But you know what? I bet there's some mm. you know laboratory out there who wants to fly a mission who won't mind a used dragon, yep. even a doubly used dragon. You know, I, I think there's going to be plenty of companies out there or plenty of entities that would be willing to fly in a used booster or a used capsule if the price is right and which totally. is after all the whole point of doing this yeah, yeah. exactly interesting so um do we know anything else about the well and of course one of the, the big things about the interior is you know for anyone who's either been to the air and space museum or otherwise has actually like gotten a sense of the inside of one of the the uh, apollo capsules gemini capsules is how freaking small they are yeah <laughs> I mean, a large part of that is because of these giant consoles full of switches everywhere. Mm. So, you know, it's kind of like, if you think about it, the inside of an Apollo capsule is actually relatively spacious, especially considering mm. it's only three guys in there. True. Uh, but 
if you take out all those instrument panels. Mm. So it's like, you know, I think that's kind of what they're going for. It's like, you know, you can take out all this stuff and you end up with a simpler vehicle with a little more spacious, a little bit better for like, you know, for the, the astronauts to feel like they're not just crammed in there, but it also leaves room for, you know, they can bring extra cargo or, you know, whatever mm. else, extra experiments or, you know, something else to bring along other than mm. a bunch of metal bulkheads or whatever. <laughs> yeah, relays and toggle switches. And yeah. That. Yeah, exactly. So I think it's going to be very much an open question. Although, to be fair, uh, Boeing's uh, answer to the Dragon, mm. uh, which is CST-100, also has kind of pared down the number of switches mm. quite a bit. They still have more than Dragon, but it's still like... It's a lot more like a 787 cockpit. In fact, they even named it the Starliner, which is pretty <laughs> hilarious. But uh, I, I think it's just kind of the natural way for these things to be going. We can't, we can't have big, giant switches for every little feature forever. So yeah. it's, it's a very exciting time to see how the astronauts adopt, uh, adapt to it and what kind of opinions they have on it, uh, the four astronauts they've chosen for these missions. That's cool. Now, kind of for, for perspective, um, how long would the astronauts be in one of these capsules on a trip to or from, or especially to the ISS? Uh, it kind of depends. Uh, there's a couple of different orbital paths you can take. Sure. Uh, for instance, they it's pretty much the answer is either going to be about six hours or about two or three days. Okay. Uh, yeah. Is Assuming everything's going great, you're going to have a six-hour trip. Mm. Uh, assume, if they, something goes a little bit wrong, they got to back off and kind of think about it, that's going to be two or three days as they do orbital mm. phasing. And theoretically, they could go probably like as long as a week, but I think at that point they'd probably just bring them home and say, yeah. okay, something's really wrong here. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, you've seen that with... Uh, you know, some of the automated uh, supply vehicles might take their time to get mm. out there. But with people, you know, uh, maybe maybe they'll take their time with Dragon since it's a nicer ride. But with that mm. Soyuz, they're pretty eager to get out of that thing. Let's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> kind of stuff them in there with a pole. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, and also, you know, you using a, a Russian capsule that, that's sort of been... Um, worked on for a long time it's kind of like okay let's let's let's, let's move out of here let's just let's get, keep moving you know to be to be honest i feel like i'd rather ride in a soyuz than on the first dragon <laughs> <laughs> they've been using well, those things for like 40 years now so it's kind of like oh, it's not pretty but it, 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 it it's over engineered and it works <laughs> it, it, uh, yeah the, the soyuz is like the you know the 10 year old sob you know, where it, it maybe maybe a little you know um, rough around the edges, but damn it, it's gonna run every morning. You know. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, in this case, I guess the forty-year-old. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, that's very exciting. Cool. So, do we know kind of what's the uh, the, the schedule for the, the dragon moving forward? Yeah, so they did the pad abort test where they yeah. uh, uh, tested, a, they want to test a different worst case scenarios for hmm. um, in mission abort. One of them's on the pad itself. The next one they're going to do is rough, right around maximum dynamic pressure, like when the atmosphere is kind of pressing them mm. back at the, at the heart, um, with the most force during launch. I think that's scheduled for some time next year, kind of got pushed wow. around. Or um, I've even heard like, that it's possible that they might try to do it after the first orbital flight because it wow. doesn't really matter when they do it as long as they do it before people get on board. Mm. Uh, I think they're targeting, uh, at this point, early 2018 for uh, people to actually ride it. Okay, gotcha. And uh, as far as I know, they haven't quite decided, is it going to be SpaceX employees, NASA astronauts, mm. or a combination of them? I'm pretty sure that Boeing, they've chosen one NASA astronaut and one Boeing test pilot mm. are going to be going on that, which is like awesome that that's even like a thing they're debating. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly what SpaceX is planning on that. But yeah, I mean... Pretty, pretty soon, you know, That's in amazing. the context of a space flight. So I'm real excited for that stuff. Yeah. So if, you know, if you want your chance to actually go to space and not be an astronaut, maybe now's the time to submit your, your resume to SpaceX. Yeah. And SpaceX, Boeing, Sierra Nevada, Blue Origin, mm. NASA 2 while you're sure. at it. Yeah. <laughs> NASA 2. You never know. <laughs> Cool. That is absolutely amazing. We live in inter interesting times. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you.